Well, hello everybody and welcome to another episode. Two or three years ago, I made a video about four manual film cameras that I considered best value at the time. But that was two or three years ago and I've shot a lot of cameras since then. So it's definitely time for an update. Manual film cameras put the photographer in control and they teach you about photography. If you master one of these cameras, there are very few other cameras that you won't be able to pick up and shoot straight off the bat. These are also green cameras because digital cameras, SLRs, mirrorless, eventually will wear out and they won't be able to be repaired. The same will happen to auto exposure film cameras. Manual film cameras, however, because of their simplicity, because of their mechanical nature, you'll always be able to find somebody who can make parts, either turn them up on a lathe or 3D print them. So as well as being the cameras of the past, these are also the cameras of the future. Any one of these cameras will last a lifetime. Now here's a green camera that's also a red one, by which I mean to say this camera is a product of the former Soviet Union's photographic industry. It's the Zorki 4K, which to me is one of the nicest looking former Soviet rangefinders. They're all broadly similar. Most of them are pretty cheap too. We've got a Zorki 1 here, we've got a Fed 4 here. This is the Zorki 4K and it's got this nice uh, lever wind handle which is so much nicer than the knob wind on the Zorki 4. So there is the Zorki 4K rangefinder and I really do like the design of this camera. I like this step here at the side. I like the fact that the deck has different levels here. 4K well, if you think, uh, if you expect that this camera would be able to shoot video in 4K, you'll be mistaken. This was just a kind of modern sounding name for the time, for what was essentially a very old camera, a very old design of camera. So I do like the styling of this camera, but it's not just a pretty face. This is a very capable, very able photographic machine. It has a lovely big viewfinder at the back here, and that is a combined viewfinder and rangefinder window. It's not like the very old, uh, the Zorki 1 or the Fed 1 or the uh, the old Barnack Likers, which had two separate windows here. The Zorki has combined the viewfinder and the rangefinder. So when you look through there, you see a nice big bright viewfinder, and it is very big and bright. And you also see the rangefinder patch as well to give you focusing. Let's look at the top deck. They're always a little bit rattly, these cameras, because the, the later Jupiter lenses have a bit of play on the focus ring. It's not a manufacturing defect, it's just how they were made, but they do rattle a little bit. Anyway, the top deck. So there we are, there's the top deck of the Zorki, and you can see that it's very, very simple plain, clear and uncluttered. We have the wind lever here. Push it right around. I have to push it a fair old way, but it is only one push you have to give it. There's the shutter release. And that is quite a loud shutter. Uh, unlike the older uh, Fed cameras, and certainly unlike the Leica cameras, this Zorki does have quite a loud shutter. We have the shutter speed selector here. One thing to bear in mind on these cameras is that you can't change the shutter speed without first winding on, as I just did. Once you've changed it, once you've wound on rather, just pull up on the selector and drop it into one of the slots. It's not terribly easy or comfortable to use, uh, but it does work effectively. Shutter speeds are one second to one thousandth of a second, and B. It's got a diopter adjuster as well for the viewfinder. That's this little control here. So you can adjust the viewfinder exactly to your eyesight, and that's a nice feature. So this is a very capable 
camera and it has all the features you'd expect to find on a manual film camera. It's very simple, it's very clean, it's very uncluttered and it's got a kind of a nice look. But it's not as well finished as a Leica. These instrument uh, controls rather are actually slightly, let's look over here, they've got this sort of knurled edge and it can be a little uncomfortable to turn them actually but they certainly are grippy there's no doubt about that so the same here on the shutter button it, it, it's not particularly well finished but there was a very different philosophy in the former soviet countries at that time than there was in the west Western cameras, Western consumer products have a wow factor. They have to be attractive and desirable and shiny and uh, all of that. These cameras didn't have to do that. They had to be attractive and desirable, of course, to the people who were buying them. But what KMZ have produced here, that's the Krasnogorsk mechanical plant, have produced here is a practical, viable, usable capable photographic tool without any of the silly fripperies that go along or went along still do go along with western goods i think that gives it a certain understated chic there's nothing on this camera that doesn't need to be there it's very plain it's very simple it has everything you need and nothing you don't need and that is the beauty of this camera Another great thing about these cameras is, and all the Soviet rangefinders, former Soviet rangefinders in fact, is the lens mount. It is an L39 lens mount. Let me show you. So there is the L39 screw mount. Just inside there you can see the rangefinder cam. If you get one of these make sure that that's moving and not stuck sometimes they stick from lack of use so the l39 mount makes this a very very versatile camera and there are well certainly hundreds possibly thousands of lenses that will mount this one doesn't seem to want to at the moment can be a bit tricky mounting these rangefinder lenses. I find you have to, uh, there's a part that protrudes at the back, uh, this this little uh, uh, part here, this, uh, this cylinder if you like, and so as you turn the focus that moves in and out and moves the rangefinder cam so it's usually best to mount the lens with it sticking out just a little bit so let's try again. There we go, that's better. So that mount makes it really versatile and there are, as I say, at least hundreds, possibly thousands of lenses that will fit from manufacturers like Leica, Canon, Reed, uh, all of the Soviet, former Soviet manufacturers uh, make lenses in this, or made lenses in this, L39 mount. The Jupiter 11 here is a beautiful 135mm f4. We've got the little Fed 10 here. We've got the Jupiter 8, which we've talked about quite a lot on this channel. Many, 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 many lenses that will fit. You will not go short of lenses using this camera. This camera is a real oddity. It was made right up until the mid 1990s but it was already out of date, well out of date by the mid 1960s. And what it really is, is a throwback to the type of photography that people used to do in the 1930s and 1940s. That's the kind of technology that's built into this camera. Now that old tech helps define the look and the aesthetic of images too. Lenses focus, usually rangefinder lenses focus only two, three feet or one meter. That's their minimum focus distance and they can't go any closer. So there are no close-ups in rangefinder photography, just like there weren't any close-ups in 30s and 40s photography. 
it's not easy to follow and keep focus on a moving target, so shots tend to be static. Now, having said that, there's no reason you can't shoot it any old way you like. Be inventive, be creative, but in general, by and large, this old technology does encourage a certain old school feel in images. It's a sort of a baked in look, to some extent at least. So as regards cost, these sell for between 40 to 60 pounds or thereabouts in good condition with a lens. And usually the lens you'll get is a Jupiter 8 50mm f2. And this is a gorgeous lens. It's a genuinely beautiful thing. Do not look down on the Jupiter 8 because it's a very, very, very nice lens. And this little combination, this little kit, you can make some fantastic images with it. The lens goes perfectly with the camera. They complement each other perfectly. There's nothing to get in your way. The camera doesn't get in your way. It becomes almost invisible. And it's around 40 to 60 quid for a fully featured rangefinder camera. That's got to be a bargain. Right, so next we have an East German camera from the mid-70s. It's an SLR. It's the Praktika MTL-5B, and I think this was the final evolution of the MTL-LTL series. If it wasn't the final one, it's one of the final ones before Praktika started making the electronic BC-1 and the BCA cameras. They were nice little cameras. This, I think, is the last or one of the last of this line. It's an unpretentious but very capable camera and it's an original design as well, unlike a lot of the former Soviet cameras, certainly almost all the rangefinders are based on Leica or Contax designs. This is an original one. It's a very simple and straightforward little camera. There are no surprises with this little camera except perhaps for the unusually placed shutter button which is on the front here and in fact it is rather easier to operate than a shutter button in the standard position which i find a little bit of a stretch sometimes the practica button falls right where you want it just there it's quite a loud shutter as well i'll demonstrate it's not quite as polished or finished with as much finesse as the top of the line western models but it's nicely finished it feels nice the metal is smooth the vinyl cover is just vinyl but it's nice vinyl it's a really nicely made camera and don't forget it was never intended to compete with the top line western models this always in the western countries was sold as a cheap camera so there was no real attempt to compete with the likes of Olympus or Nikon or Canon. What it is is a good, solid, reliable, capable little machine that doesn't pretend to be anything other than what it is. Let's have a closer look. So there is the Practica. It's a fairly large camera, though I don't think it's any bigger than a Nikon. It's nicely made and it feels nice in the hand as well. And I'm pretty sure this is all metal. I think this top is metal. It certainly feels cold to the touch. The bottom is certainly metal. The body is metal. And I think inside is metal as well. Let's have a look. Yeah, the chassis is all metal. I don't... don't can't see any plastic in there anywhere, so this is a real, you know, nicely made camera. It has a metal shutter as well. Several metal blades. It's very much a 70s design and it certainly has the classic SLR look. It's got lots of silver and black. It's got a chrome finish to the shutter button and these screws here to accentuate various little bits. There's a chrome flash around the uh, shutter speed dial there. The top plate is really simple, very uncluttered, very clean. Shutter speeds run from one one thousandth of a second to one second and B. 
and on these cameras you can change the speed before you've wound on so that's one thing that you don't have to think about there's a frame counter over here and that turns as you wind the lever uh, this control here the shutter speed control if you lift it you'll see that uh, you can change your ISO setting that's uh, shown in the little window there and then over here we've got the uh, rewind crank come on there's the little rewind crank and if you pull that up then that will open the back of the camera so a really simple clean uncluttered top plate here's the window for the viewfinder the viewfinder is really big and really bright it's not the biggest but it's plenty big enough there's an excellent focusing screen as well with micro prisms and a very effective diagonal split image most slrs i've used have a horizontal split image but this one has a diagonal split image which is very useful and it's also got the micro prisms just like any western slr actually and it's a very very easy camera to focus and to use also in the viewfinder window here we have a needle which moves up and down to uh, show how much light you've got and you set your shutter speed and your aperture from that when it comes to lenses on this camera you are spoilt for choice because this camera has an m42 screw mount slightly bigger than the m39 mount it's just a simple screw thread there we are so a very simple screw thread in there and a corresponding screw thread on the back of the lens there just there so just put that in there Whoop. screw it on and you're done and in fact it's rather easier to get these lenses mounted than it is the range finders they can be a little bit fiddly sometimes that m42 mount means there are thousands of lenses probably more than the l39 range of lenses there are thousands and thousands maybe tens of thousands of lenses made in m42 mounts from big name manufacturers like pentax pentax invented the mount as, as i understand it carl zeiss jena made a lot of m42 lenses lots and lots of third party lenses lots and lots of lenses from the major manufacturers all in m42 mount all waiting to be shot on this camera you really are spoilt for choice with lenses uh, on any m42 camera i really like this camera it's simple it's honest it's uncomplicated it doesn't pretend to be anything other than what it is it has everything you need and nothing you don't need a good one will cost you around 40 to 60 pounds with a lens and there are a lot of these around there's no shortage of them the lens you get for that price may very well be the Carl Zeiss Jena Tessar 50mm 2.8. That's a very, very nice lens. It's not particularly fast, but it's a really nice lens. Body only, these go for £20, if that. You can often find them cheaper than that. And uh, really, effectively, the body itself has little to no value in absolute commercial terms so you can pick one up very very cheaply get some nice lenses get some nice film you really can't go wrong and for what it costs this camera too has got to be a bargain and it's a worthy member of my best value manual cameras list the Nikon FM is another camera that is very simple very straightforward in its design and in fact in its design philosophy and its ethos it's not unlike the Practica in fact it is better made and finished though and it feels like a real quality machine in the hands everything in this camera every part of it is tight precise perfectly fitted perfectly machined and you can feel that just holding it in your hand it really is quite something everything's made to far closer tolerances than it is on the 
practica over there the controls have that little bit more precision and they're just that bit nicer to turn everything just feel tight and nice and made to very fine tolerances when I want to shoot some film this is often the camera I pick up because it's simple it's conventional and the quality is very very high its simplicity means it gets completely out of its own way. You don't have to think about this camera. You can think about the shot instead. There's nothing to consider but aperture, shutter speed and focusing. The best cameras are often said to be an extension of the photographer's eye. Well, this one I think goes further. This feels like an extension of the self. Now, I hope you can see that the standard of finish on this camera is very high indeed it's a very very nicely made machine i'm not sure if that will come through on the video but if you just simply look at this deck here the fineness the precision with which this is made it really is quite astonishing this camera has a very large very bright viewfinder with inside it an LED light meter. Again, a very simple thing, but you don't really need any more. The wind lever, let's look at the top plate. The wind lever here switches the camera on. So pull it to that first position and you're switched on. That is the meter, because remember there are no other electronics in this camera, only the light meter. So pulling out this uh, handle, this lever, turns the meter on. Earlier models used a conventional switch I think around the shutter button somewhere. There is a dedicated double exposure control which is this little switch here you just slide that so when you slide that across and you wind the camera on it doesn't wind the film it just cocks the shutter so then you release that and now you're ready to take your double exposure. And you can hear from that this camera, as pretty much all SLRs, has a rather noisy shutter sound. The film plane symbol is this little symbol here. I don't know if you can see that. That's marked on many, many uh, cameras, mirrorless cameras, film SLRs, digital SLRs. And that tells you where the film sits. That line tells you exactly where the film sits in your camera if you need to make any measurements. So that's what that symbol means if you see it and you weren't sure what it means. Being a Nikon camera, this camera has a Nikon F mount, which was developed, I think, in the late 50s and is still in use today. So what that means is this camera can mount any Nikon lens since the 1950s. So again, there are loads and loads and loads of lenses that you can choose from. What's on here at the moment? We've got a very nice 50 millimeter 1.4 on here. The release for the lens is on this side here. And curiously, I've never quite understood why Nikon lenses all twist in the opposite direction to all other cameras. That's how you get the lens off. You have to twist it the opposite way. So the 51.4 is on here at the moment. I don't have a great many Nikon lenses, but I do have some nice ones. This is a lovely one. This is the, what's this one? 85mm f2. This is a beautiful beautiful lens. I've also got the 43 to 86 zoom lens, the second version. And that's a really nice lens too. Very surprisingly good quality for a zoom lens. And somewhere, I don't know if I've put it out. Oh yeah, I've also got a Series E 50mm f1.8 lens. And these lenses were made for, well they were a, a sort of a cheaper series of lenses that Nikon made for their camera, the Nikon EM, which was an aperture priority only camera. And the Series E lenses all came with that. 
and they're nice lenses and the great thing about them is they're actually quite a bit cheaper than um, most of the other Nikon lenses so Series E lenses work really nicely I've found this is a really nice little camera I did buy it for a channel video actually about three years ago but it was so nice that I kept hold of it it's just an absolute gem it's simple it's uncomplicated it's uncluttered it feels like it could last forever and with proper care and servicing it probably would I paid 150 pounds for this camera with this series E lens and I don't think that figures moved very much since so although Nikon gear can be a little more expensive it really isn't that expensive to get into Nikon photography if that's what you want to do and you know when you think about it the way I think about it 150 pounds for a pro level camera that will last as long as you want it to I think that's fantastic value a very very nice camera indeed and a worthy placeholder in my list of best value cameras finally today we have the OM-1 a very beautiful a very small manual film SLR from Olympus holding it in your hands the most obvious thing is its size this thing is really tiny it's very little bigger I think only a matter of millimeters bigger than one of the old Leicas and I've got a copy Russian copy of that camera here and we can see that in fact the Olympus is only very slightly wider than the uh, Leica design and it's not too much taller either in fact if I put them this way around we'll see that although the yeah they're, they're almost the same height apart from the uh, prism hump on the OM-1 so this is a really really small camera just like the other cameras here it's a very simple machine and a very capable one too let's have a closer look and there's our lovely little Olympus let's have a look at the top deck there it's very clean and uncluttered although as it's smaller than the FM it's rather more crowded the main difference in controls is the location of the shutter speed selector so where it would usually be here we've got the ISO the film speed selector so the shutter speed selector is actually on this concentric ring here on the lens mount and if I turn that you can see the shutter speeds changing that does take a little time to get used to but it does mean that aperture focus and shutter speed are all in the same area and that's a nice bit of design there is also in that same area a depth of field preview and that is where is it it's this switch here actually on the lens and that's the depth of field preview and hopefully you should be able to see the aperture yes there we are there's the aperture changing as I push the depth of field lever so everything is in the same place all the controls that you, you need quickly and often are in the same place but in all other respects this camera is entirely conventional now one thing you do need to watch for is cracks in the hot shoe there's a little hot shoe that sits on top of here a removable hot shoe you'll notice this camera hasn't got one because like most of them now it was cracked and brittle the plastic got old you you actually screw them on and people tend to to uh, uh, screw them on a little bit too tight and they can break so if you're buying one watch out for the uh, hot shoe being in good order and in fact I think 
you know, that hot shoe was never really up to it. You're going to put a big flash on there. There's weight and the strain and the stress on there. And it's just not up to the job. So if you want to use flash on these cameras, probably best use an external one. This camera uses OM Zuiko lenses. Now, if you've watched this channel before, you may know that the OM Zuiko lenses are some of my all time favorites. They're beautiful. They really are. They're really good looking. They're beautifully made and they make absolutely fantastic images. Broadly speaking, there were two versions, the older versions had a silver ring around the uh, front of the lens here and those are known as usually known as the, the silver nose versions without the silver ring uh, are known as the black nose versions the silver nose versions are said to be lower in contrast uh, some of them are not multi-coated they do make nice images though I, I don't find any fault with with any of these Zuiko lenses the best of the Zuikos are said to be the ones that say made in Japan uh, on the front plate of the lens here and you can see that this one is one such I do have another one of these this isn't in the best condition it's got a little dent on the ring somewhere but yeah, so made in Japan versions are often said to be the best. But there are some absolutely beautiful Zuiko lenses. The 51.8 that's on here at the moment is really, really nice. There's a 53.5 macro. I think I've got it over here. That is a really nice lens. It's a bit slow, but my goodness is it sharp and the colours are out of this world. We've also got... 100 mil f 2.8 this is one of my favorite Zuiko lenses the Zuiko lenses are very small and short but if I compare this one to the 85 mil Nikon so you can see that the 100 mil Olympus on the left here is actually taller uh, sorry is actually about the same size as the 85 mil Nikon on the right here so Zuiko lenses do tend to be um, very small, very compact, and they really make beautiful images. 100mm f2.8 here. There is another 100mm f2. That's a rather expensive lens, but it's a very nice lens. They're just fantastic Zuiko lenses, and just like with the other cameras, you're really spoilt for choice when it comes to your lenses on these. They're absolutely lovely. As far as price goes, You'll pay around about 120 to 130 for one with a 50mm f1.8. If you want the 50mm f1.4, then you're going to end up paying around about 150 to 170 pounds. So, four fantastic manual film SLRs that, because they use simple technology, will carry on shooting as long as you want them to. Film won't ever disappear as it's relatively easy to make. So with one of these cameras, you're future proof. So that's it from me for now. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. I hope you found it useful. Please don't forget to like, subscribe and ring that bell before you go. And if you like the content on this channel and you'd like to support it and help it grow and develop, you can do that at patreon.com forward slash xenography. As ever, thank you very much for watching and I will see you next time for some more Xenography.